Rockets are magnificent engineering feats that have allowed us to travel into space and orbit over the past several decades. But though rockets are extremely cool, they cost massive amounts of money and carry substantial risk during each flight. In contrast, we have our other flying masterpiece, the airplane. Not only can airplanes also fly, but they're astronomically cheaper and more reliable than rockets. In fact, the annual risk of an American being killed in an airplane crash is only 1 in 11 million. To put that into perspective, NASA estimates that there is a 1 in 276 chance of a Falcon 9 disaster leading to loss of life. That means that one of the most reliable rockets of all time is still 40,000 times riskier than your average plane. But let's be real here, I'm sure the brainiacs working at space agencies around the world have already considered this. So why haven't we created planes that can just fly into space? Well, to answer this question, we have to first understand the physics behind how airplanes fly in the first place. While it may seem like the powerful engines on airplanes are doing all the work in keeping us airborne, this is actually not true. In fact, the engines on airplanes are quite weak in comparison to the maximum capacity of the plane. The ratio between the force generated by a plane's engines and the gravitational force pulling down the airplane is called the thrust to weight ratio, and you'll be surprised to hear how low these ratios really are. The Boeing 747-8 only has a thrust to weight ratio of 0.269, and the largest passenger aircraft, the Airbus A380, only has a thrust to weight ratio of 0.227. The thrust to weight ratios of most commercial aircraft land between 0.2 and 0.35. Even the Concorde, which was a supersonic commercial aircraft, only has a thrust to weight ratio of 0.372. But if airplane engines are only generating enough thrust to lift a fifth to a third of the plane's maximum weight, how is the plane even able to gain altitude? Well, this is where extremely clever engineering of the wings comes into play. The underside of an airplane's wings are flat, while the top side of the airplane's wings are rounded. This means that the air flowing on the top side of the wing has to travel a further distance than the air on the bottom side of the wing. The total volume of air flowing on either side of the wing, however, is the same. So, the air on the top side of the wing is spread over a larger area than the air on the bottom side of the wing. This difference causes the top side of the wing to have a lower pressure than the bottom side of the wing. Given that particles naturally want to move from high pressure to low pressure, the wing naturally wants to move upwards, and this force is called lift. If we're able to create a large enough pressure difference between the two sides of the wings, the generated lift will be greater than the gravitational force pulling down the airplane. And that's the secret behind how airplanes actually gain altitude. Over the past several decades, engineers have basically perfected every single component of the plane, from bending the tips of the wings to utilizing flaps. All of these efforts have one goal in mind, maximize lift and minimize fuel consumption. While this has made airplanes insanely efficient, it has also made them extremely dependent on air. Without air, most of our planes wouldn't leave the ground. But what if we just put more powerful engines onto our planes or made the planes themselves smaller? If we could get the thrust to weight ratio to be greater than one, airplanes wouldn't need lift to gain altitude, right? Well, that is true, and we actually have a bunch of fighter jets that do have a thrust to weight ratio that's greater than 1. The F-15 for instance has a ratio of 1.04, and the F-22 has a ratio of 1.09, which can even be increased to 1.26 with the right combination of fuel and payload. This is why these jets can do vertical takeoffs, loops, barrel rolls, and who knows what else. But just because these jets are not dependent on lift does not mean that they are not dependent on air. And that brings me into the fundamental difference between rocket engines and jet engines. Both engines use combustion and Newton's third law to move forward. But if you think about it, you'd quickly realize that a jet engine has both an intake and an exhaust, while rocket engines only have an exhaust. Jet engines have an intake because they rely on the oxygen in the air for combustion. Without a steady intake of oxygen, combustion can't take place, and the jet engines simply won't work. Now, it's not like rocket engines are any better. Rocket engines also need oxygen to work, and this is why we have solid and liquid rocket propellant. In a solid fuel rocket, the fuel and oxidizers mix together into a chemical, and the engines simply use the chemical during flight. With liquid fuel rockets, the fuel and the oxidizer are actually stored separately, and the engines combine the two ingredients during combustion. But either way, both jet and rocket engines need oxygen to operate, and since jets don't carry oxygen along with them, they can't just fly into space. So, the bottom line is basically just a lack of atmosphere in space. Planes need the atmosphere to generate lift, and they need the oxygen in the atmosphere to fire up their engines. If the atmosphere didn't thin out as we reach space, planes should theoretically be able to fly anywhere in the solar system, 
though it would be a rather slow mode of transportation. But since that's not the case, airplanes generally have a surface ceiling, which is generally around 42 to 43,000 feet. What if we just dropped rocket engines to airplanes though? As long as the thrust to weight ratio is greater than 1, the aircraft would no longer be dependent on the atmosphere. People have actually had this idea for nearly 100 years at this point, with the first rocket-powered flight dating back to the early 1900s. In 1928, a German plane called the Lippuschente became the first aircraft to fly using rocket power. A couple of years later in 1931, an Italian aviator named Ettore Cataneo built the first privately built rocket plane. We also saw several rocket-powered aircraft throughout World War II, but it wasn't until the Cold War that we actually tried to use this technology to reach space. The most notable spaceplane attempt of all time was likely the North American X-15. The X-15 was proposed way back in December of 1954, which was before NASA even existed. So, the plane was to be built by North American Aviation and Reaction Motors. The plan was to carry the X-15 on a mothership called the B-52 to an altitude of 8.5 miles at a speed of 500 miles per hour. At this point, the B-52 would release the X-15, and the X-15 would use two liquid propellant rocket engines to fly as high as possible. Fortunately, the X-15 actually made it past the concept board, and the first rocket power flight would take place on September 17, 1959. Over the next decade, the various versions of the X-15 would be flown 199 times. Fun fact, one of the pilots of the X-15 was Neil Armstrong. Anyway, in 1963, pilot Joe Walker would successfully fly the plane past 100 kilometers in altitude, which meant that the X-15 could officially reach space. But aside from technically reaching space, the X-15 couldn't actually complete anything meaningful in space. It couldn't reach orbit, and it was nowhere near escape velocity of Mach 33. But nonetheless, the plane was extremely impressive as it could reach Mach 6 or 4,000 miles per hour and it was a great first step in developing a plane that could actually travel into space. After the X-15 program came to a close, NASA decided to basically develop a hybrid space plane with the space shuttle. The idea was to launch like a rocket, but land like a plane. But this is when NASA would run into by far the largest obstacle when it comes to space planes, and that's excessive heat. Though the X-15 was an extremely fast aircraft, it could only reach one-fifth the speed of escape velocity. Speeding up the aircraft to escape velocity itself was extremely difficult, but that wasn't the main obstacle. The main problem was that it was and still is nearly impossible to handle the generated heat. But wait a minute, we have rockets that go way faster than the X-15, so how are they able to handle the heat? Well, that's the reason that rockets launch vertically, at least at the beginning. The idea is to get the rocket as high as possible before it reaches extreme velocities. At these higher altitudes, the atmosphere will be much thinner, which heavily reduces the generated heat. The easy solution to this problem would be to just launch the space plane vertically, and that's basically what NASA settled on with the space shuttle. At that point, it's more of a rocket than a space plane. But even after doing this, NASA faced major heat problems when it came to re-entry. The underside of the space shuttle had a total of 20,548 heat shield towels, and every single towel had to be individually inspected after every single flight. Even a small amount of damage to these heat shield towels could lead to catastrophic results like we saw with Columbia. So, truthfully, NASA never figured out an efficient way to refly the space shuttle, and this was one of the biggest downfalls of the space shuttle. Considering this, NASA should have never tried to make a full-on space plane until they figured out a more efficient solution for the space shuttle. But, nonetheless, NASA started to work on a single-stage-to-orbit space plane called the X-30 in the 1980s. The plane was slated to have top speeds of Mach 25, and it seemed like the plane would be straight out of a movie. This should have been a major red flag though, as the plane was way too overambitious. According to NASA engineer Ivan Becky, the X-30 was the biggest window ever to be foisted on the country, and it was full of dubious aerodynamic claims and engine performance claims and thermal claims. Basically, NASA had nowhere near enough technology to make the plane a reality, and the $1.7 billion invested into the project was a complete waste. NASA didn't give up after the X-30 though, Later on, they started working on the X-43, which did reach production, and it was able to achieve a top speed of Mach 9.6. But even that isn't nearly enough to reach orbit. In the meantime, the overarching space community has come to a broad conclusion. What's even the point of trying to solve this nearly impossible heat problem with space planes, when we can just keep using traditional rockets and continue exploring space? At the end of the day, who cares if the vehicle launches vertically or horizontally? The destination is what really matters. Though it would be super cool to fly a plane into space, it really doesn't pose any additional benefits. 
Originally, many scientists thought that space planes were the key to reusability and cheap launch costs. But SpaceX is proving that these attributes can be achieved using traditional rockets. So the excitement around space planes is more or less dying off. Maybe decades from now, after we've mastered traditional rockets, we'll see space planes make a comeback. But in the meantime, it makes no sense to try to battle with the laws of physics when you can just launch vertically. Would you prefer to ride in a space plane or a traditional rocket? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you thought this video explained the physical limitations of space planes well. And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.